Hey there, it's Dr. Kim again. This is Module 6. I'm going to cover four topics in this lecture. All of them are related to your research project, the AB User uh, Content Testing. So first, I'll describe what I mean by user content. Second, I'll explain how non-traditional publishers measure the performance of their content. Third, I'll explain some research basics specifically for content professionals. And finally, I'm going to explain the specifics for the AB content testing project. Let's go! We'll start with the description of user content. To begin, I suppose I should make it clear what type of organizations publish content today. It's important for you to understand there are two categories of publishers for which techcom professionals and others work. Traditional publishers include newspapers book or periodical publishers, but by far the majority of people in our profession work for non-traditional publishers. Examples would include software companies like Atlassian, where tech writers traditionally worked on paper documentation to accompany products, but now they put almost all of that content online. Non-traditional publishers also include engineering firms like Floor, where tech writers now create case studies for posting on a website instead of for print brochures. The last example here is meant to signal that non-technical companies like NFL football teams also publish their own web content. Sarah Kessler said it well back in 2014 in a Fast Company article. Thanks to the internet, anyone can now be a publisher. The fact that nearly all of this content publishing happens on the web through a digital device means the audience for all that content is appropriately referred to as users. Describing what counts as user content is something that people who create content for a living probably understand better than most, but even these folks sometimes fail to grasp all the types of content their organization creates, if it's not the type they create themselves. Let me give you a typical content type list from Kevin P. Nichols, who's the author of a book titled Enterprise Content Strategy. You ready? Annual reports, biographies, calendar or event listings, contact information, email, fax, FAQs in other words, forms, images, glossaries, infographics, instructions, legal disclaimers, maps, news items, blog posts, podcasts, press releases, product details, support or help content, user guides, user-generated content, tutorials, videos, and white papers. Whew! That's a lot of content. Based on a 2019 article from HostGator, I've listed the most common types of web pages on organizational websites on the left. To get a better handle on common types of content, we're going to look at two examples. We'll start at IKEA's homepage. From here, we can go to their products page and find categories of products like beds. There'll usually be a link in the footer of every page to information about the company. If we visit that page for IKEA, we'll see there are lots of individual topics at IKEA. A smaller organization might have a single page with information about the company. Typically, this is where there's some company history. There's also some way to contact the organization. At IKEA, that's through customer support. Notice there are several categories within customer support. There are many other types of pages possible. Here we have a careers page with information about getting a job and working for IKEA. Now I'm showing a different type of page that you might not find by starting at the IKEA homepage. The reason I found it is because I got an email from the company with an offer. There's a link in the offer email. When I click it, I'm taken to a specially designed page that's just about that offer. That's what's called a landing page. These are some of the most commonly A-B tested pages on an organization's website. They're explicit forms of advertising. Now let's look at a different type of site to see what kind of pages it includes. I'm going to click on a link in Twitter that shows an article that's got an interesting title to me. 
So it takes me not to a landing page, but to the article itself inside what is an e-zine called Content Science Review. Notice I get a pop-up requesting that I sign up for regular email updates. It's a way of getting me to be more engaged with the organization. It's a mini conversion. More about that later. This e-zine is different from IKEA in terms of page types, largely because it is an e-zine. We can visit a list of topics. If we go to the footer, we see how to advertise on the e-zine. The footer also includes policies, for instance, on sharing or republishing. I didn't point that out on IKEA's site, although they also have pages with policies and other legal information. Note that if I click on the sponsors link, Content Science, now I get to an organizational website. It's more similar to IKEA's. But this is a company that sells services instead of products. From their home page, I can view the About page, Clients, Capabilities, Products, Publications. So let me summarize the main points I want to make here. Nearly every organizational website will include four types of pages. Home, Products or Services, About Us, and Contact. Those are like the bare bones pages. Many organizational sites, especially in larger organizations, will also include landing pages connected to advertising campaigns. And they're likely to have some others too, for example, careers or news or publications. Before we move on, it's probably a good idea to talk a little about user content in terms of something called the sales or conversion funnel. The instructional materials from Kissmetric and HubSpot in Module 6 mention measuring as far down the funnel as possible. They're talking about this funnel shown on the slide. In other words, what they mean is the ideal A-B testing from a marketing perspective measures purchases. You might call them sales. That's the ultimate measure of whether content works. I'll talk about this more in the next part of the lecture. What I want to highlight now is that traditionally, TechCom pros created content that's delivered at the bottom of the funnel after a buyer makes a purchase. That's when they need, for example, an installation guide for the company's software product. However, in order to get prospective buyers to enter the top of the funnel, companies need prospective customers to be aware of their product. That's why they produce advertising content. The creators of that content are usually in a marketing unit within the company. In the past, TechCom and Marcom writers rarely interacted. But way back in 2014, Scott Abel, also known as the Content Wrangler, gave a presentation called The Future of Technical Communication is Marketing. He made a convincing case that customers are not well served by the separation of content creation within a company. Abel said, once a prospect buys a product or service, the content they interact with is no longer familiar. The instructions provided don't look, feel, or sound anything like the marketing and sales materials that introduce them to your brand. Neither does the service contract, the warranty, the customer support website, the product documentation, or the training materials. So this is where user experience or UX comes in because there's a less clear separation based on where the user is in the conversion funnel. The point is that users need content at all stages of the buyer journey. Now that we have a shared understanding of what types of content organizations publish on the web, I want to help you think about how an organization decides whether that content is performing as they intended. I'm going to start with this graphic, which is based on information in a chapter on content ROI, that's return on investment, in a book titled Content Strategy by Rahel Ann Bailey and Nas Urbana. The graphic shows that ultimately publishing content, like everything else done by an organization, is only valuable if it makes an organization more profitable. That can be done by making more or spending less money. That's important for any organization, whether their motive is more profit to keep for themselves as a for-profit business or more profit to add to what they can provide to others as a non-profit. 
The outcomes on the right are the ways content can influence the bottom line. Building brand loyalty and increasing revenue lead to more money. Managing risk and increasing efficiency lead to lower expenses. Changes in the scope of work can influence either revenue or expenses. The point here is that to understand the performance of content, you can't avoid talking about the ultimate bottom line, money. For web content, the page is usually the unit of interest. So, of course, quantitative page content performance is measuring what happens on a web page by counting, using numbers. Marketing professionals talk about three performance measures of web content. Reach, which could be measured by counting the number of times someone visits a page. Engagement, which could be measured by counting the minutes spent on a page or the rate at which people immediately click out of the page once they arrive. That's bounce rate. The most important content performance measure for marketing in particular is conversion. The big one is counting the number of times someone buys an item. But you can count some other actions like the number of times an item is added to a shopping cart or even the number of times someone chats with customer support as a type of conversion. For user experience or design professionals like Jan Cardello at Nielsen Norman Group, there are other actions to count to gauge page performance. In a 2014 article, Cardello called these micro-conversions, like counting the number of people who subscribe to a regular email update or who download a white paper. Her boss, Jacob Nielsen, reminded us that most organizations are better served by looking at both short-term that's conversion, and long-term, that's micro-conversion, measures of performance. Qualitative page content performance is measuring what happens on a web page by describing it in words rather than numbers. When it comes to web page performance, user experience professionals categorize measures into two types. Behaviors, which could describe, for example, the actions a user takes while on a page, that might mean keystrokes or where on the page their eyes focus. And the other type is attitudes, which could describe how users feel after visiting a page or, or what they say they intend to do after visiting a page or how satisfied they are with their experience while completing some action. While marketing professionals also use qualitative performance measures, they're usually more focused on quantitative measures. Techcom and UX professionals are often more interested in qualitative measures. Carol Ong and Mario Vandermeulen published an article in 2019 titled Design Research versus Market Research. It's helpful in understanding the kinds of content research done in these two different business areas. I've adapted one of the figures from their article on this slide. Organizations conduct both marketing and design research to answer questions about users or customers. Both of them may collect qualitative and quantitative data. The difference according to these authors is, simply put, market research goes wide to understand who and what, design research goes deep to get clarity on why and how. If you've done any UX work or taken any UX courses, many of these research methods should be familiar to you. You'll see that A-B testing is listed here. It is most commonly used in marketing, specifically advertising research. That brings us to part three of this lecture where I'll explain some of the basics about research. I want to give you just enough to better understand what the choices you make mean within the context of your own work as a content creator and, of course, your upcoming A-B test. To make these concepts more understandable, I'm going to use a workplace scenario as the context within which some techcom research could be done. Let's say you're a senior documentation manager working for a large multinational manufacturing company within a division that custom designs manufacturing products for customers. Custom products mean custom content. Multinational means lots of translation. That means your team is very busy dealing with complex content issues. The good news is that you have management support for improving the work processes related to technical publications. 
you're interested in a variety of areas, but you decide two questions are of most importance to you right now. What documentation is available at each customer site? You may not be certain what they're actually, what they have. It doesn't matter that you sent it. It matters that they have it and which type they have. More about this in a minute. The second question is, where is the most recent documentation located? So where at in the manufacturing plant or in whose office? All of those things are relevant. So these are the two questions that you want to answer and you can't answer them without doing some research. Before we dive into the scenario, we need to start with just a brief discussion of variables and measures. Here's a simple example. If we study the effect of temperature on mood, both temperature and mood are variables. They're the focus of your research. Because we're interested in how mood changes, it's the dependent variable. Because we want to know what influences mood, temperature is the independent variable. You should know I'm using these terms in a simplistic way to avoid going into details that aren't really relevant at this point in our course. Technically, independent and dependent variables are used only for research that's highly structured or controlled. That means experiments. The concepts are useful, nevertheless, in less controlled research. So we need to measure variables in some way to investigate their relationship. We can measure temperature with a thermometer and mood with participants who judge their own mood. In our workplace scenario, your focus is on the independent variable we could describe as availability of your tech pubs. To understand availability, we could use three dependent variables. Documentation type, version, and location, somebody's office or on the manufacturing floor. Now type might be measured nominally by categorizing all possible documentation you produce to support your products. Could be an installation guide, troubleshooting guide, release notes, could also be digital versus paper. Now version might be measured nominally as well as by date, right? Measuring location would probably be nominal as well. To include both the geographic home, in other words, the city and country of the customer site, and the job roles of personnel with direct access to the documentation, like plant manager, maintenance engineer, etc. You can tell already, determining the specific and best measures for variables of interest in research is not always an easy task. It's impossible to discuss quality in research without using the terms reliability and validity. A thermometer that shows the same reading of 82 degrees each time it's plunged into boiling water gives a reliable measurement. A second thermometer might give readings over a series of measurements that vary around 100 degrees. The second thermometer would be unreliable but relatively valid, whereas the first would be invalid but perfectly reliable. So how do we apply this to your attempt to learn the answers to your questions about your company's tech pubs? So your answers will be reliable if someone else independently comes to the same conclusions you do. Your answers would be valid if they're actually correct. We can use validity in a pretty straightforward common sense way simply to refer to correctness or credibility of whatever the conclusion, explanation, interpretation is. The idea of objective truth isn't essential to validity. How could you get the responses you need to answer your questions about type, version, and location of your documentation at customer sites? The information you need is available at each of the 40 sites. You have to decide whether the cost of observing every site is warranted, whether you can get information of high enough quality through something like virtual meetings or telephone interviews, and maybe with only a sample of customers instead of all 40 sites. How do you decide which of these 40 you're gonna use? Well, random probability sampling, 
let's say you think you'll have time and money enough to analyze five sites. Then you randomly assign numbers to each of the 40 sites and pick every eighth one for collection so that you end up with five. That'd be site 18, 16, 24, 32, 40. You get the idea. Random sampling of a population ensures that the most valid research results will be collected. On the other end of the scale, convenience sampling offers the least valid results. It means that the researchers recruit users based on convenience, whoever the researchers have regular interactions with. Often this means students, coworkers, whatever. In the workplace scenario, maybe you would only talk to the people that you knew already. Well, the good news is there are sampling techniques that provide a sort of middle ground between these two extremes. One of them is called maximum variation sampling. In our workplace scenario, you might use this strategy when choosing interview participants. You've got a population of all workers at the 40 customer sites. You might improve the quality of your research by choosing from each site, let's say, two kinds of employees, technology novices and experts, or workers from a range of job descriptions. The success of this technique lies in the researcher's ability to identify the relevant variations of participants. Another technique is called typical case sampling. If you know that workers in a single job description make up the vast majority of your product's users, then you improve the quality of the information you collect by choosing to talk to workers with that job description. On the other hand, if you know that a small but important subset of your documentation users make purchasing decisions, then you might improve the quality of your collected information by choosing to involve workers from that job description. All of the strategies that are outlined on this slide constitute an attempt to make systematic and rational choices about the examples used in collecting information. All of them have to do with enhancing the quality of your research. There are several additional techniques you can use to improve the quality. One common technique is called triangulation. The collection of information from more than one method or more than one source. You might use this technique in our workplace scenario by both visiting one customer site so that you have observations, personal observations, and then also your primary method, which is interviewing. You could do kind of the same thing by talking to more than one individual at each customer site. You could implement multiple judges by having a research partner who interviews some of the same individuals you do. Then you could compare your answers and see if you were getting the same results. You could implement external review by, let's say, adopting questions for interviews in some article that was published. And finally, you might use iteration by planning to talk to your research partner after you complete one interview. Talk through and determine if you should change anything about your questions or your procedure before doing the rest of the interviews. Again, all these techniques help a researcher reach more credible conclusions. All right, we're going to move away from the research scenario that I've been, the workplace scenario I've been talking about now, and start talking about A-B testing. You understand some basics about workplace research. Now we're going to focus specifically on content research that uses A-B testing. I've broken the process of A-B testing into four phases. I'm going to discuss each of these in the next few slides. So you start by creating two content versions, A and B. What varies between the two and how much, those are dependent on your goals. The upside to testing a single element of your content, whether that's the tone of voice of copy or a graphic or the placement of a button, is that that one element is then tied directly to any differences you find in user behaviors or attitudes. The downside to testing a single element is that you may actually have several elements you'd really like to test because you predict that more than one thing affects the performance measures you've chosen. 
However, you just have to remember if you vary more than one element and find differences, you won't know which element made a difference. In the course project, I've removed the choice. You're supposed to test only tone of voice in copy. So you're going to create two messages that are identical except for the linguistic variations needed to alter their tone. Tone is your independent variable. We need to talk about how you present this content, your two message versions. The standard in A-B testing done by marketing pros is to actually create live versions of, for example, the same landing page on a website or the same email and then send them out exactly as they will look. This is called high fidelity because both versions are in their published or final form. Sometimes it makes more sense to test low fidelity versions. This is similar to the practice in UX design with wireframes and prototypes. The page you're seeing on this screen represents a lower fi version of a web page. It could be even lower if it was all sketching. You should choose the fidelity of the content you test in the course project based on two things. First, what would you like to show in a portfolio to potential employers? Second, how much time do you have to devote to web page design? Answers will differ for each student depending on your current expertise and your ultimate career goals. Talk about your goals with your teammates. In the second phase of A-B testing, you create the rest of the test, which means choosing the dependent variables and how you're going to test them. Ultimately, you're investigating whether tone influences content performance. Remember I discussed a variety of performance measures in part two of this lecture. For your A-B research project, you can't probably measure engagement through something like page views, a behavior, because you're testing copy from a single page. And your test won't actually measure whether users share your content by clicking an icon to send it on to Pinterest or wherever. But you could add a question about their attitude towards sharing. Along the same lines, your test might measure user attitude toward clicking a learn more button, even if you aren't able to actually measure the behavior of clicking. I'm trying to make the point that your dependent variables in your A-B test for the course will probably focus on user attitudes about content instead of user behaviors. I already mentioned that the tone of your two message versions is the independent variable in your A-B test. You're investigating the influence of tone on attitudes or behaviors. Identifying any difference between the two is done by measuring changes, the dependent variables. I just provided examples of attitudes or behaviors you might test, and I want to take a moment to explain the different types of measures that you could choose from. For example, if your test includes questions designed to measure how the versions affect feelings, you could measure that dependent variable in three ways. An interval measurement would list a feeling, like happy, and then a scale from which the user would select the intensity of that feeling. I feel it a lot. I feel it a little. Your results for all users could then be averaged for happiness, and those averages compared for the two tones of voice you created. An ordinal measurement would list multiple feelings, excited, angry, along with happy. Ask the user to rank them in intensity. Your results for all users could then be used to compute preference scores for each feeling for each tone of voice. Happy was more preferred, was preferred by more users. Angry was second. And finally, a nominal measurement would list multiple feelings, happy, angry, excited, and ask the user to select all that apply. Determining the specific measures for variables of interest in research is definitely not an easy task but you should think about the advantages and disadvantages of the types of measures you choose for the performance test in your project. Once you've created your test, the third phase of an A-B test is to give it to the users and collect information about the tone they experienced and their attitudes or behaviors. Before you actually administer the test though, you have to set up the tools or materials for delivering it to users. We've already talked a little bit about whether the content is low or high fidelity, but the same is true for your survey type questions. You have to decide how you're going to deliver them. You could invite users to your office 
or to coffee or somewhere and have them use paper and pencil. But there are many online tools that make this process much simpler. Um, they automate data collection and allow you to download a spreadsheet with results afterward. It's definitely worth looking into, especially because Google Forms is an awesome free tool. I recommend it to you for your course project. In fact, I supplied a link to a sample A-B test uh, in Canvas so that you can look at one, you can see what one might look like. Of course, you also need to recruit test participants. The more they are like your actual users of the content, the better. Um, ideally, you're going to split your users randomly between the two content versions. All the odds get version A and all the evens get version B. Then the final phase of A-B content testing requires that you use your test results to make recommendations about the content, about the tone of voice. Summarizing and analyzing the data you collected is much easier if you use an automated tool. That's why I'm telling you I think Google Forms is worthwhile. You can download Google Sheets into Excel if that's what you prefer to do. And ultimately, you have to present your insights and recommendations to decision makers. But I'm going to talk about that in Module 7. This lecture is long enough. You and your teammates need to spend some time planning your own A-B tests. Have a great week. 